Welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast, brought to you by TournamentPokerEdge.com, the only podcast dedicated exclusively to poker tournament strategy. Now here's your host, Clayton Fletcher. Hello once again, everybody, and welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast, sponsored by ACR Poker, where right now we are in the middle of of the Winter Online Super Series, or as I like to call it, the WAS, $35 million in guaranteed prize pools and a $35,000 leaderboard funded by the website and not taken from the buy-ins and entry fees from the players. It's all happening in the month of November on ACR Poker. My name is Clayton Fletcher, and I am currently in Welland, Ontario, Canada. And yes, I also don't know exactly where that is. I'm on a whirlwind tour of the Great White North. I'm doing book signings of the ROI of LOL. And I'm also appearing this weekend, tonight and tomorrow, at Yuck Yucks in Burlington, Ontario. So if you're looking for something fun to do this weekend, come on out to Yuck Yucks in Burlington. We have shows at 8 p.m., November 10th and 11th. I've been in Canada now for a week, and I really like it here. Uh, Last night, I was out in Windsor, actually. Windsor, Ontario is very, very close to Detroit. And at one point, uh, there were no games going in the poker room. They just had one, one, two table going. They had no tournaments. And I was considering taking a trip across the river into Detroit, Michigan, where they have the MGM Grand that I played at not that long ago and really enjoyed myself there. But then another player here on this side of the Detroit River informed me that they are on strike over there. And so I did a little research, and sure enough, all three Detroit-area casinos are having a big problem with uh, management and labor dispute. There's a strike going on. Uh, From my understanding, all the poker rooms are closed. They've got uh, picket lines outside, and there's a lot of turmoil over there. So I'm glad I did not make the trip across the bridge because I would have been very disappointed to drive over there and then find out that although we only had one game in Windsor, there were no games at all in the MGM in Detroit. So You know, uh, that's a saga that's been going on now for over three weeks, and uh, it shows no sign of being settled anytime soon. I think it's the same old story as most strikes, where you just have management doesn't want to pay labor the money that they think they deserve as far as the overall profits, and the company's doing great, but then the workers who actually make these places run are saying, where's our piece of the pie? So that's what's going on over there. I don't know when that's going to end, but it looks like the SAG-AFTRA strike has finally come to a uh, conclusion, a happy conclusion, so we can all look forward to Hollywood entertainment getting more back to normal than it has been in recent months. But that's not the big news for me. The big news for me is that I got to perform at Yuck Yucks in Niagara Falls, and I got to meet a true legend of the game, Chad McVean, Wiener85. Those of you who are on Twitter know this guy is constantly promoting all of the various poker podcasts, and there are so many, but he also keeps the poker community abreast of what's happening in the world. So uh, great to finally meet Chad in person, really nice guy. And uh, according to him, I was pretty funny, so that's cool. Uh, Another piece of big news for me that I want to share is I've taken the plunge, you know, after hearing Andrew Brokus, Mike Holtz, even ACR Poker Pro Anna Marquez singing the virtues, espousing the virtues of GTO Wizard, I have finally taken the plunge. I signed up for GTO Wizard, and man, I can tell you guys, this product is, is living up to the hype. I mean, it's by far the easiest solver slash interactive training app in the world. Any spot you've ever played in a tournament can be reviewed, studied, and practiced so easily. I mean, I'm not a tech wizard myself. I've struggled in the past with other solvers and solver-type software. This one makes such 
perfect sense to me. You can actually upload all your hands from either Hold'em Manager or Poker Tracker. It's real easy to get those hands up into the wizard. And then from there, GTO Wizard just helps you find and fix the various holes in your game. It's super easy to use. I'm, I'm really loving this program. As a matter of fact, I want to start off today by taking a look back at the three hands we went over last week. You may recall I was talking about three hands I had played on WSOP.com as part of the online bracelet series. So I was trying to win a gold bracelet. I was playing in a 1K bounty tournament, and I reviewed three hands from that tournament last week. But today I want to go over them once again very quickly and just let you know what the wizard has to say about heroes play in this 1k bounty bracelet event by the way guys if you want to sign up for gto wizard yourself there's a link in the description of this podcast you can click it and get 10 percent off your first order i'm telling you guys this is an absolute game changer somebody who's bad at technology like i am i was up within five minutes i was running through hands i had played no problem at all using this very user-friendly software. So let's get into it. Uh, In the first hand we reviewed last week, we had 60 big blinds and we covered our key opponent in the hand. He had 38 big blinds. His M was 15. And this player had opened from second position to two big blinds. And we decided to go for the three bet from the small blind to seven big blinds with pocket nines. Uh, The solver loves it. GTO wizard gives me an 88% of the time score for this one so that's the best play Um, there's also the option of shoving 12 percent of the time and interesting no calls at all i think many of us might have made a mistake here and just called with pocket nines 38 big blinds and all but no you should never call according to the solver so anyway uh yeah we approve my three bet and opponent called there was 15 big blinds in the pot at that point and hero with about 31 big blinds behind the flop came queen eight tray with two diamonds and we had pocket nines with the nine of diamonds i see bet one third of the pot the solver loves it gives it a 52 percent rating i could also bet one fifth of the pot a very small bet 33 percent of the time and then it has me checking 15 percent of the time uh so the opponent called the one third pot bet and left himself with about a pot size bet remaining, at which time the turn was the five of hearts, and I decided to shove with my nines. And here, the solver doesn't like it. I think I even said on the podcast last week that I wasn't crazy about that play myself. And uh, sure enough, the solver has us checking 90% of the time and betting very small 10% of the time, but never actually just shoving for the you know pot size bet on the river. Um, as the hand played out, my opponent folded. Um, but yeah, I want to check lines using GTO Wizard. We're going to be doing this in future episodes as well. In the second hand from last week, the action folded to me in the small blind. And you guys may recall, I limped in with Ace Jack. And I kind of indicated that I would be limping in with most, if not all, of my range. Solver likes it 55% of the time limping. And then 45% of the time, you can actually raise it to four bigs. So some of you may be surprised that my limp strategy here is actually GTO wizard approved. Anyway, opponent checked and uh, the flop came ace queen five with two clubs and we had ace of spades, jack of clubs and I bet just one big blind into the three big blind pot and the solver loves it, 84%. Check the rest of the time. Never bet more than one big blind in this situation opponent called so i'm loving the fact that gto wizard is approving my plays so far then on the turn it was the seven of diamonds and i decided to bet again this time i bet half the pot and i remember saying on last week's episode that i didn't really love my sizing well not that big of a surprise gto wizard also doesn't like my sizing uh only betting half the pot about eight percent of the time the solver actually strongly prefers a 1.5x pot bet here on the turn 60 percent of the time over betting 4300 into the 2800 pot so that one kind of threw me off because you know we don't really do these over bets very often but yeah that's what gto wizard recommends 
in this spot. So whereas I bet half the pot, I should have bet three times as much as that, according to GTO Wizard. And then the river came the five of spades, and I decided to check, and the solver likes this too. Checking 92% of the time. And I guess the feeling here is that often our opponent will have a missed draw or some other hand that he or she may want to put in a value bet with that we can actually beat, namely a queen X, because remember the board is paired, so in all likelihood nobody's kicker is going to play. So checking 92% of the time, so that means I get a very good score for how I played uh, that hand overall. And then the final hand from last week, you may recall, was versus Jonathan Dockler, and I wasn't happy with uh, my play in this hand at all. He opens from the button, and I have ace-10 in the small blind. You may recall from last week, Dockler opened to two big blinds with uh, just 21 more big blinds behind, and so his M is 10. He has 23 big blinds to start the hand, and with ace-10 off suit in the small blind, I'm actually just supposed to shove 100% of the time from a GTO standpoint. So I, I, I can't do the rest of the hand because the solver already says I've made a big mistake because what I did in actuality was I three bet to six and a half big blinds, which obviously the solver doesn't like. So let me know what you guys think about this. I think it adds another dimension to this podcast. I can quickly review the hands that I uh, discussed in the previous episode on the next episode. So the hands we're about to discuss today, which by the way are coming from that exact same tournament where I was trying to win a bracelet on WSOP.com in a 1K bounty event with $300 bounties, $600 to the regular prize pool, and $100 to WSOP.com itself. So yeah, I want to know what you guys think about this. I feel like this is a good way to do it. I can still analyze the hands with you guys in the normal way, but then we can go back and check my lines with GTO Wizard in the following episode. So let me know what you guys think about this plan. I think it should work for us, but of course I want to know what you guys think. And you can always reach me on Twitter at Clayton Comic. We also have our Tournament Poker Edge Discord, which there's a link in the description to this podcast. You can join for free and join our conversation. We talk about ACR, we talk about strategies, we talk about sweats, and of course, we talk about the Tournament Poker Edge free roll, the TPE free roll, every Sunday, 6 p.m. Eastern on ACR Poker. So join the Discord and find out what's going on. All right, guys, let's continue on with our discussion of this $1,000 bracelet event. Now, at this point, the blinds are 500 and 1,000 with a 100 ante per player. We have 50K, so 50 big blinds, our M is 20, and the average stack is about 40K, so we're doing very well in this tournament. We've got several short stacks at our table, and we're looking to try to collect some of those bounties. In this spot, the action folds to the cutoff, who actually has us covered with 80,000 tournament chips. So he makes it 2K. Let's talk about his playing style just a little bit. He's been very wild. You do encounter certain player types on WSOP.com that you might not find on other sites, at least the ones that I play on. I mean, this guy was pretty much opening 100% of the time when it was folded to him in late position, which is kind of an outdated strategy. You know, as we get more sophisticated and as people get a little bit closer each day to, you know, theoretically optimal play, we're learning that your cutoff opening range shouldn't be anywhere near 100% of your hands. Now, I haven't played that many hands with this guy. I've been at this table for about an hour, but every spot where he had a chance to open from late position, he has. So we have Ace of Spades, Eight of Clubs on the button facing a two big blind open from this player. So how to proceed? I mean, Ace, Eight, is certainly a hand that can be folded. But I think under the circumstances, uh, especially given everything we just talked about with this player's style, I feel like any ace-x is probably good enough to three-bet against this player. Even though perhaps next week when I review this hand with GTO Wizard, it's going to have a fold. I think that 
even an offsuit ace eight is good enough for a three bet to try to exploit the fact that this player is, as far as I can tell, out of line. So I did go for the three bet here. I made it 7,000 tournament units off of my 50K stack, and it folds back around to the original Razor who calls. So I think I'm in a pretty good position here. We have three bet. We've built a pot in position with what is likely to be the best hand. So I think this is a good spot for me. 16,000 now in the middle, and we've got 43,000 more behind. So just about 2.7 is the SPR. And now with 16K in the middle, the flop comes nine of hearts, eight of spades, deuce of spades. Hero holding the ace of spades, eight of clubs. So we've got second pair and the back door nut flush draw. And our opponent checks in flow. I can obviously bet this flop. I mean, you know, we made a pair. We made a strong pair with a with the best possible kicker. We've also got you know, spades to fall back on in case things get hot and heavy here. And if we meet significant resistance, but you know, there's also a pretty strong case to be made for checking. You know, our opponent should probably have a lot of check raises in his range on this flop, right? Like if he maybe had pocket tens and just called the three bet, which I think is probably correct given stacks and everything. Certainly if he has a jack 10 or queen jack of spades, certainly would would be a good check raising hand um you know some of the check raises will have us beat a lot of them will be bluffs so it might be a good idea to just go ahead and check behind so that we don't have to play a huge pot with a fairly marginal hand under the circumstances however i decided that i was going to bet and just be ready to get check raised and if so the plan is to try to get all the chips in there if, if he does decide to check raise us on the flop, the plan is to get everything into the middle. The reason why, guys, again, I feel like so much of his check raising range is going to be kind of bluff heavy. You know, it's a pretty wet board. There are a lot of draws available. Something like a five, six of spades could possibly play this way. And bottom line, I'm beating a lot of these hands. And I have the ace of spades, which is one of his outs if he does have a flush draw. So, you know, let's go. Second pair, ace kicker against this opponent. I'm pretty happy to get the rest of my stack in, even if he shows strength with a check raise on the flop. And then sometimes I'm going to feel like an idiot when that happens and he turns over pocket nines and just owns my whole heart and soul. But, you know, he doesn't have pocket eights very often when we have an eight. And I'm not really sure that he would have called the three bet with pocket deuces. So we're really just worried about pocket nines and pairs that have flopped an over pair in this spot, which is really just tens, maybe jacks, but certainly queens, kings, and aces should be pretty comfortable getting all in for 50 big blinds, especially when they can collect my $300 bounty. So I don't expect him to have slow played at aces, kings, or queens very much. So yeah, we're not really that worried about the hands that can check raise us. I feel like it's a bluff heavy check raising range and therefore i'm pretty happy to try to get all in against it and sure enough i decided to bet very small almost trying to induce that possible check raise there's sixteen thousand in the middle i fired out for 4k with my second pair ace kicker and my opponent immediately check raised to twelve thousand. i really wanted to shove immediately but instead i just took a deep breath and i talked to myself about I wasn't going to be mad if I busted out of this tournament on this hand because I had a strategy and I was deciding to go with it. So yeah, I shoved all in and my opponent called rather quickly with the king of spades, 10 of spades. So he had plenty of outs. He can beat me now with a king or a 10 or any spade. So he had, if my math is correct, 14 outs. So we're basically trying to win a coin flip to stay alive in this tournament which is exactly what we did. I'll definitely review that hand with the uh, solver and the GTO wizard artificial intelligence. But yeah, I obviously want to know whether ace eight offsuit is even in the three betting range in the first place. I think that my play on the flop is pretty good. But yeah, I was a little, I'm questioning whether the solver will like my exploitative three bet pre-flop. All right, guys, let's do one more hand today. Uh, this is a little bit 
later, but still in the same level of the tournament. At this point, we have 98,000 in our stack after having won that big pot in the previous hand. So this was a little while later, maybe like one orbit later. The blinds are about to go up, but we're still at 501,000 with a 100 ante per player. So at this point, we have 98 big blinds. Our M is 40, and we are the chip leader in this bracelet event. Yeah, it feels so good to see that first on the leaderboard, even though, you know, like late registration was still probably open, you know, and it's like nowhere near over, but it, it is nice to have a, a good stack in a bracelet event. Anyway, in this hand, the action folds to me in the hijack with my 98 big blinds, and I have pocket jacks, so uh, I raise it up just a minimum here, just made it 2,000. Uh, the button, two to my left, is a known professional, an excellent player. He is loose, aggressive, and he just calls with 50,000. So he makes the call on the button with 50 big blinds, and the blinds fold. So this time we're going to be out of position versus a talented opponent in a heads-up pot with pocket jacks. So with 6,500 in the middle, the flop comes nine of diamonds, seven of spades, tray of spades. We have two red jacks. And in this situation, I do not like checking, especially not having a spade in my hand. Too many cards can come to cause us problems later down the road. Uh, you know, I obviously don't want to see any over cards, but even a spade is going to make things harder for us. So I decided to fire. I bet 1800 into the 65 hundred pot so just uh 1.8 big blinds and the button calls so now we're heading to the turn and with ten thousand in the middle the turn comes the seven of hearts pairing the board our board is now nine seven tray seven i decided to check and here's my thinking the opponent decided to call my flop bet now maybe he's floating maybe he's got something maybe he doesn't I think in all likelihood the jacks are good. Of course, our opponent could have a seven, right? Maybe he decided to call pre-flop with a hand like eight, seven suited or seven, six suited. Certainly in his range, it's not outside the realm of possibility that we're beat. We also could have been beat all along, right? Maybe our opponent flopped, uh, you know, set of nines or set of trays, whatever. I'm not too worried about all that, but, you know, you do have to acknowledge that it's a possibility. Anyway, I decide to check this card. I'm hoping to induce bluffs or possible value bets with worse. Maybe like if our opponent does have a nine, if he has a hand like ace nine suited or 10 nine suited, he flopped top pair and now I'm checking to him. There's another reason why checking makes a lot of sense to me in this situation. And it's because guys, so many times I'm going to have ace queen, ace king, king queen, ace jack, all these hands that now have absolutely nothing. I need to protect the, the times when I'm checking, planning to fold with those hands. I need to have some hands where I'm checking, planning to call. So we call this protecting your checking range. And I don't see enough of you all doing that in the tournaments that I've been playing of late. You know, generally when somebody gives up on the turn, it, it apparently gives up on the turn. He or she does in fact give up on the turn. So obviously you want to be harder to beat than that. You can't just give up on the turn and expect to win money in the long run. You've got to have some times where it looks like you're giving up, but in fact you are checking for pot control with every intention of calling, which is what I'm doing here. I'm checking, knowing that I could possibly be beat, that I usually will not be beat, and I'm absolutely never folding. So I check and the opponent fires 5,400 into the 10,100 pot and I decide to just call and I'm not raising here. I want to keep his bluffs in. I don't really think I can get called by too many worse hands, although possibly a hand like ace nine or maybe a flush draw would call and I could you know manage to get a lot more chips in there. I'm pretty comfortable with the size of this pot right now. I'm not really sure if we want to try to get all in. Anyway, there is 21,000 in the middle now and the opponent has about 40,000 behind, and the river comes the queen of spades for a final board of nine of diamonds, seven of spades, tray of spades, seven of hearts, queen of spades. So not only did the board pair on the turn, but now 
An overcard to my jacks that also completes the flush hits on the river. It's hard to imagine too many worse rivers than this one. Obviously, I don't want to bet my jacks now. Although, actually, come to think of it, maybe a small kind of blocking bet, a defensive bet, maybe something like 6000 would be good because uh, I might have to call a much larger bet. And maybe that is a good strategy. Maybe even going a little smaller, just kind of freezing him up those times when he has a, a nine and can pay us off. Or maybe if he just made a pair of queens on the river, he may have been emboldened to value bet that card if I had checked on the end. So yeah, I guess there is some merit to making a small kind of blocking bet, like a defensive bet here on the river. But I did not do that. I decided to go for a check and I was hoping my opponent would hate that last card as much as I did and would check behind. But instead, he bet 7,000 into the 21,000 pot and now Clayton has a decision. So I'm getting four to one on a call and I need to know, do we think that my hand will be good more than 20% of the time? I don't know. I mean, I guess so. I'm not sure what I can beat that's bluffing. I mean, it's a pretty rough spot. I mean, there are certain gut shots, like I guess, you know, Jack 10 or 6-5 that had a double gutter on the on the flop. I guess, you know, those hands are certainly in this opponent's range, I guess. Yeah, but otherwise it's pretty tough because he either made a pair of queens a lot or he got there with his flush draw a lot. And so I was kind of just sick facing this bet because the problem is for me, like I know 20% of the time isn't very often. And, you know, is he just trying to milk me for another 7K? And if so, would he do that with a nine? That was really the problem I was having sitting there thinking, you know, would he value bet 7,000 with a hand that I can beat something like ace nine, right? With no spade. It's tough. I really don't know. Um, But I shrugged and I called and my opponent turned over the jack of spades, 10 of clubs. So he called my smallish flop bet with uh, two over cards, a gut shot and a backdoor jack high flush draw. So I have no problem with that. Um, And then he just kind of went crazy uh, trying to bluff me off of my hand by betting on both the turn and the river. And honestly, guys, I think a bigger river bet would get me to lay down my pocket jacks. But given the price and given the fact that I know about this opponent's proclivities, I decided to close my eyes, make the call, and boy, was I happy that I did. Next week, we'll absolutely review these hands using GTO Wizard, my new favorite toy. (laughs) And uh, yeah, guys, if you're not yet on ACR Poker, what are you waiting for? You know, the time is now to join. You can click the link in the description of this podcast and receive a first time deposit bonus, 100% up to $2,000 just by using the promo code TPE. And so for everyone here at Tournament Poker Edge, With special thanks, as always, to our very generous sponsor, ACR Poker. I'm Clayton Fletcher. Thank you so much for listening. I want to hold them like they do in Texas, please. Fold them, let them hit me, raise it, baby, stay with me. Lock in intuition, play the cards with babes to start. And after she's been hooked, I'll play the one that's on her heart. Without a gun And baby when it's love it It's not rough it isn't fun